The race for the red planet. Billionaire and space explorer Elon Musk has announced an ambitious plan to establish a colony on Mars. He wants to send 100 people using a large spacecraft. So, is Mars our next destination? This is Inside Story. Hello and welcome to the program. I'm Hazem Seeker. A mission to Mars, that is the goal of one of the world's leading explorers. And SpaceX founder Elon Musk says we can start sending people there within a decade. Not only that, he says staying on Earth forever could put us at risk of extinction. And Musk believes we need to become what he calls a spacefaring civilization. We can bring life as we know it uh, and, and breathe life into Mars where it, it doesn't exist today. Um, and ensure that if there is some cataclysmic event on Earth, that life as we know it continues to exist. A future where we are a space-bearing civilization and out there among the stars is infinitely more exciting and inspiring than one where we are not. Um, you basically have to have to hate humanity if you don't like that future. Well, Musk says the first spacecraft will carry 100 people and the trip will take about three months. Some parts of the technology have already been tested successfully on a smaller scale. And Musk says the estimated cost of $10 billion a person could go down. But NASA has warned about the possible health risks, including higher chances of cancer, worsening eyesight and muscle loss. And it's unclear whether people would be able to survive on Mars once they got there. Mars exploration has been a work in progress for decades now. NASA first captured close-up pictures of the red planet in 1965, and the Soviet Union landed the first unmanned space rover in 1971. From 2011 to 2013, NASA's Curiosity rover collected evidence that liquid water once existed on Mars. And the rover also detected methane in its atmosphere, which on Earth is produced mostly by living creatures. And businessmen like Musk and Virgin Galactic founder Richard Branson announced their plans for private trips to Mars about five years ago. Well, time now to uh, bring in our guests in Bristol. We have Philippe Blondel, Deputy Director of the Center for Space, Atmospheric and Oceanic Science at the University of Bath. And in Houston, joining us uh, on Skype is Eric Berger, Senior Space Editor for Ars Technica. Good to have you both with us, gentlemen. Uh, so, Philippe Blondel, insane but not impossible is the is the headline I read uh, on the phys one of the headlines I read on the feasibility of this. What's your view on it? I think this is a very exciting challenge. Uh, there are, of course, difficulties on the way, technical difficulties and human difficulties, but uh, the possibilities that we have uh, are very exciting. The first uh, uh, trials of the rockets have shown their potential. The way ahead has in, been clearly marked in terms of technical challenges. Most of them are being resolved or resolved now. So we're definitely getting there, at least on the spacecraft point of view. Eric Berger, how feasible do you think this is and, and how realistic even? Well, those are two interesting questions. I think the first question is, is it feasible? The answer is definitely yes. Um, uh, there is no magic in the physics of this. Uh, all of these technologies that, that Musk outlined in his presentation are doable with our existing uh, technology level. We have the engineering capability to do this. The question is, do we have the will uh, and the, the funding to do it? Um, SpaceX does not. Uh, NASA would have the funding, but it's got its own journey to Mars, and so there's some question as to whether or not it would be interested in funding this program. I think the answer is that the United States Congress probably wouldn't be, at least in the near term. So um, Elon Musk is going to have to go out there and find funding to enact this vision from somewhere. And he says it's probably going to cost about $10 billion for the first missions. Uh, it's probably going to be more than that. Uh, so it's, it's quite a bit of money. Uh, Philippe Blondel, what about the timeline? I mean, he's talking about getting a manned mission there by 2024. That's not, that's not far away. That's, that's eight years away. Is that realistic? I think uh, it might be realistic, but usually with space missions, it pays to be a bit pessimistic to think about the technical hurdles along the way. We saw, for example, a spaceship exploding uh, during refueling a few weeks ago. 
uh, these things do happen every now and then, so we have to plan plenty of uh, buffer time for the actual missions. So I would love to see it happening by the timeline uh, given of 2022-2024, but we might have to expect delays on the way, so it might be a bit later. The main thing is to keep the momentum, to keep the push for this mission. Eric Berger, uh, NASA thinks that that's not really a, a realistic target. It sh we should be thinking more 2030s. W what's your view on that? Uh, I, I think that it's, to some extent it's funding dependent. I, I see almost no chance of a 2024 launch that, that Mr. Musk mentioned during his speech in Mus Mexico. That assumes a lot of things go right, um, and, and I think they, they would not hit that target. I would be shocked if any human missions to Mars launched in the 2020s. Um, NASA, which has vastly more resources but does things far less efficiently than SpaceX, is targeting the late 2030s for human landings on Mars, and even I think that's difficult. In addition to the technical challenges in, in terms of building the big rockets and the spacecraft, you need to find ways to keep humans alive because the radiation on the way to Mars, you need to figure out how to safely land in there. There are a lot more challenges than simply building the initial spacecraft and rocket. This is an idea that has great emotional appeal, Philippe Blondel, to, to many people. Uh, but does it address why anyone, whether they're governments, corporations or other organizations, would even want to get involved in this and, and fund this effort? Yes, of course. And the first uh, emotional appeal is exploration, finding new territories, discovering new things, expanding forward, exactly the same way that people have done over the last centuries or millennia on Earth. But uh, there are other types of appeal as well. There is the possibility of finding life present life or past life on Mars, maybe fossils or uh, even small bacteria that would be very exciting and uh, sensational. But uh, even if it's unlikely at the moment, there are other appeals in terms of expanding the frontiers, living in space, living on other planets. There are techni technological achievements that we can bring there uh, in terms of controlling ecosystems, uh, making sustainable uh, platforms where people can spend a long time in space. So all the benefits of going to Mars can be expanded further in space, but also on Earth itself. Eric Berger, why Mars? I mean, does, does colonizing Mars even make sense as uh, the next big venture in, into space, especially when you consider that there might be more realistic options like uh, going, going to the moon again, for example, or setting up a colony, uh, a, a, a space station uh, something, something like that. Why? I mean, Mars seems to a lot of people to be perhaps a little too ambitious. I think I would be among that camp. Uh, the, certainly the European Space Agency and, and other partners for NASA have encouraged the space agency here to refocus on the moon as a near-term destination before going to Mars. But for Elon Musk, it's not so much about exploration. Is, is his overriding goal, as you mentioned in, in your introduction, is to make humanity a multiplanetary species. He thinks at some point this world is going to face some kind of extinction event. It may not happen for 500 years. It may happen, you know, in the next few decades. But his concern is having a backup plan for humanity. And, and of the bodies in the solar system, Mars is probably the most livable, livable world. It's not to say it's a garden spot. It's far less hospitable than even Antarctica on the surface of the Earth. But if you're going to go found a colony in the solar system, Mars is probably... Um, the best bet, it has subsurface water in the form of ice that you could tap into. It has a thin atmosphere. Um, you, could, you could scratch out a living on the surface of Mars, whereas you couldn't on the gas giants or on Venus or on other planets in the solar system. Well, let's talk a little bit more then about, about this idea, Eric Berger, that you bring up about uh, that he believes, that Musk believes that we could one day face extinction uh, on Earth and, and so we must become these interplanetary beings. I mean, it does seem like the stuff of, of Hollywood science fiction, but I mean, but it's also, it, do, it does seem a little bit uh, almost um, p pessimistic. There's a lot of doom and gloom there. I don't know that it's doom and gloom. I mean, his, his, his vision for this ultimately was inspired, I think, by his youth um, by the Apollo landings, the cool stuff NASA was doing with the Voyager probes, television shows like Star Trek. You know, he thought he would grow up in a world where NASA and other space agencies around the world would kind of figure this space travel thing out. And there would be more than six people living in space at any one time, and we'd be among the stars living and working and flying around on spaceships. Uh, for a number of reasons, that's not what happened after the Apollo program. NASA pulled back and has remained in, in low Earth orbit. And so Elon, you know, has a, has a fortune. 
Um, so he founded a couple companies uh, 10 or 15 years ago in SpaceX and then Tesla. Um, and he's trying to make the changes in the world he'd like to see. So it's, it's not a pessimistic vision. I think he's concerned about that. But really, he's driven by saying, what could he do um, to improve humanity? It's a big question as to whether he'll succeed or not, but he's giving it his best try. Philippe Blondel, what's your view on this? Uh, d does this idea uh, seem a little apocalyptic uh, to you, that, that this idea that we, we have to find other planets uh, to live on? Well, that's a moral as well as a scientific debate. And we see the effects of climate change around us right now. We know pollution is a major concern as well. So we can try to address it, but that doesn't mean we shouldn't look at other planets and try to avoid these mistakes when settling there. But uh, I think it never hurts to have a plan B. Arthur Clarke, who was born in Somerset, so not far from here, was a science fiction author who said humanity couldn't live in its cradle for the rest of its life. So moving out to other planets or to space is a very good idea. And I don't think it has to be framed as plan A and plan B. It's mostly exploration, going there and doing exciting things in terms of understanding the solar system, understanding the universe, and uh, overcoming all the technical challenges. Well, let's talk a little bit more about, about the cost of all of this, Philippe Blondel. Um, because, I mean, he, he's saying it's, it's uh, on his estimates, it costs about $10 billion uh, per person, which is, which, which is pretty high at the moment, or, po or possibly more than that even. Um, is this the kind of project that SpaceX should even be doing alone? Should they be getting together uh, with other organizations and other ventures uh, to put this together? Collaboration is always better in space because there are very big efforts. The figure of $10 billion was at the beginning of uh, the speech by Elon Musk and about what the costs are with current technology. After that, during his talk, he announced his aims of lowering the cost to uh, around the cost of a house in the US, so around $200,000 per person, which seems much more feasible. How this is going to be achieved in practice still needs to be resolved, but at least it's a good roadmap or a good business plan for the future. Exploration is always a very risky business. We have seen lots of probes going to Mars and being lost on the way uh, because of uh, difficult conditions, because of the landing conditions, or sometimes just because of uh, bad luck. So collaborations with other institutions or other private partners are always desirable. Eric Berger, when we talk about the costs of this, th these are clearly uh, ventures that are being led by, by private um, groups. And it's almost as if uh, government agencies are, uh, like NASA are, are, are being left behind. But is there still a role that they can play? So um, Elon has said during his talk, and, and my you know, read on this as well, is that his first choice for a partner in such a mission would be NASA, would be the United States government. That's where his company is based. He's worked closely with NASA for 10 years. They provided a lot of revenues, actually, that have supported his company uh, through their flights to the International Space Station. Um, and so he would choose to partner with NASA first. The question is whether NASA would want to partner with uh, Elon Musk with such a big venture. And I think the answer to that right now, at least, is no. NASA has its own journey to Mars. It's slower, more methodical. Uh, approach uh, much, much more costly as well, um, but it's, it's co Congress here is, is comfortable with that. And so I think Elon, with his speech on an international stage there in Mexico, was really kind of announcing to the world that, hey, we've got this pretty cool architecture, and for not maybe not $10 billion, I would guess probably at least 20 to $30 billion U.S. dollars, uh, if there's another country out there or a group of countries that are interested in, in putting the first human on Mars, uh, we've got a plan for you. Philippe Blondel, as far as the potential dangers of, of such a mission, there are many that have been highlighted. Um, the, you know, the idea of what life would be, how difficult life would be life for human beings uh, on Mars. Uh, there's the issue of getting back and having, and having enough fuel. There are all of the, the, the technical hurdles, uh, protecting humans from the radiation levels, all, the, all of those sort of things. You think that these are things that, that can be solved in, in, in due course? I think the uh, first danger that people think about is what happens to human bodies on space missions. The differences in gravity are going to uh, lead to weight loss, 
uh, less calcium, so more fragile bones. And the longer people stay in space, the more difficult it is going to be for them to readapt to, to life on Earth with normal gravity. The other thing is that uh, as uh, we move into space, there is the danger of cosmic rays. Uh, missions to Mars will be away from the Earth, which is protected from most uh, eruptions from the Sun or cosmic rays by its magnetic uh, belts. But as we go further into space, uh, big solar storms like the ones which are happening right now will be felt much more and might affect uh, human bodies. After that, living on Mars, there are, of course, all the problems of finding the right resources. The first plan that was presented in the talk by Elon Musk was about finding uh, propellants for refueling the spaceship. In that case, that means accessing uh, reserves of methane and oxygen for the methalox fuel. How to scan, uh, how to use remote sensing to find these resources is going to be the first step. Then assess how deep they are. If they are five meters below the, sea, the, below the uh, surface, it's going to be much easier to access than they, if they are 50 meters down. So all this is going to constrain where people are landing, what they are doing out there. And after that, there are all the problems of living very far away for a long time. What about the food? What about the air? What about all the recycling systems? So all these are problems that need to be addressed one step at a time. Well, what about all that then, uh, Eric Berger? What's, I mean, uh, Philippe Blondel just outlined uh, all of the, the many challenges there. What's you, your view on, on, on the physical obstacles uh, of, of getting to Mars and staying on Mars? I think once you get away from Earth and, and near Earth orbit, it's very, very difficult to keep humans alive. Um, uh, it, there are just lots of spaces, a very dangerous place. Uh, Philippe mentioned the radiation. Um, you've got to clothe these people for, for months. You've got to feed them. You've got to dispose of their waste. You've got to recycle the water. These are some of the systems that we're testing kind of with the space station, which is kind of the 1.0 version of a lot of these life support systems. But we're pretty far away from really being confident that we can send a group of humans into deep space for a long period of time with no hope of coming back to Earth Earth protective grasp, uh, you know, in a short order. And so these are major challenges. These are things that NASA has looked at for decades. Um, and they're beginning to solve some of them. But, you know, that was one of the disappointments I had with the talk in, in Mexico. Um, Elon talked a lot about safely getting people to the surface of Mars. And he said SpaceX is a transportation company. But there wasn't a whole lot of, of how you would keep them alive on the surface of Mars, which is, you know, we talked about earlier, it's not exactly the most hospitable place. And given all of that, uh, Eric Berger, it, it really does take a certain kind of person uh, to even want to do this, uh, doesn't it? I mean, he talks about uh, being able to take 100 people uh, uh, on, a, on a spacecraft to, to go there. But how do you convince the, uh, people to, to even want to do that, to, to leave Earth for, uh, I don't know how many years, possibly forever, and to deal with all of those challenges, the physical challenges that we talked about? Well, I think that there's a couple ways that I would answer that. First of all, I thought it was pretty courageous uh, what Elon did is, is get up on stage and essentially bare his soul. Here was the vision that he'd been working on in his mind for decades, literally, and, and some of the architecture that SpaceX had put together in the last 10 years of, of how he would actually go about implementing this vision. And he put it all out there. And it's going to invite a lot of criticism. Uh, there are people, he has really upset the global launch industry, and so the, the, these other space companies are going to probably attack some of these plans. Um, so I, I, I would give him a lot of credit for putting this vision out there and starting this, what I think is a pretty important discussion. As for finding people to go, I don't think it'll be too much of a challenge. I mean, humans intrinsically, uh, a lot of us feel the need to go out and explore, to look over the horizon, to see what is over that next hill. And, and really, you know, Mars is the great challenge. It is the destination goal. It is the new frontier that, that we could be opening up. And so I don't think there will be a shortage of, of people who would go there in a pioneering spirit. And, you know, you look at the mass migrations in, in history, you know, and beginning with out of Africa and then crossing the Atlantic Ocean to the New World, you know, going west across the United States, the first Aborigines who went to Australia and then colonized the Pacific. People and humans are willing to take risks. And I think Elon will find no shortage of qualified people interested in, in becoming the first to go to Mars. Philippe Blondel, is that um, the, the, the thing that really drives uh, us in, in, in wanting to go to a place like Mars? Is this 
constant need to find new destinations, the, the, the whole curiosity factor? Yes, I agree. I think that uh, exploration and curiosity are uh, the main drivers and you don't need to convince people. The people will want, well, some people will want to go to Mars anyway. So it's more screening the right people and making sure we have the right quality of people getting there because these are going to be very long and very challenging missions. I don't think there is a need to convince them. They will be convinced by themselves already. What do you think are some of the other challenges that uh, perhaps uh, Elon Musk didn't address in that announcement, uh, Eric Berger? I think it goes back to really the feasibility question. How do you implement this? He, he talked about how SpaceX is now spending a few tens of millions of dollars a year on, on these Mars programs. Eventually, we'll spend about $300 million a year. He's going to need on the order of 3 to $4 billion a year. And so, you know, the biggest question in my mind is, is he's got to find a backer. And if that's not the United States government, which in the short term, at least, I don't think it's going to be for these Mars ambitions, then who is it? Um, is it someone in Europe? Is it maybe perhaps even some country in the Middle East that would like to, you know, beat NASA or the, or the Western world to Mars? Philippe Blondel, um, does this, yeah, I, I know you, you, say, you want to respond to what you just heard there? I think well, I agree with uh, uh, these comments. The other thing to think about is what people are going to do once out there on Mars. So assuming everything works well, even if it doesn't stay to the schedule, but at least we get there somehow in the next decades, what are people going to do there? And how do we look at planetary protection? This is a big issue with uh, uh, space missions to other planets. How do we make sure we don't introduce microbes or germs from Earth onto other environments. This is addressed by the uh, COSPA treaties of uh, the 1970s. All the missions currently used have very strict uh, sterilization procedures and planetary protection effects. How is it going to work when we have hundreds of people for each spaceship coming there? What are the effects on the uh, uh, systems around? and how are they going to live in the long term. So I think these things need to be addressed as well. Eric Berger, I just want to get back to the question of, um, you know, th th this isn't something that uh, SpaceX has, has come up with all by themselves. They're not the first ones to put forward this idea. There are other uh, people uh, such as uh, Jeff Bezos, the head of Amazon, um, and Richard Branson from, from uh, Virgin, who are also talking about this. Um, how did this compare with what they've been talking about? And again, it goes back to the question of, should they be getting together more? Okay, so that, that's a very good question. Musk's ambitions are much grander, um, at least to the extent that they've been revealed so far. Um, Richard Branson has been much more focused on suborbital space tourism. Um, so that's essentially flying a spacecraft up into space for a few minutes and then back down to the surface. Um, that's a big challenge, but that does not compare at all to what, what uh, Musk is proposing to do. Jeff Bezos with his company Blue Origin is doing lots of interesting things to do and he actually is quite a bit richer than Elon Musk so he could implement a kind of Mars vision if he really wanted to. Uh, but his, his, he's more focused on commercialization of space um, and I think he's more, much more interested in the moon and possibly asteroids and, and figuring out ways to, to harvest resources there to, to move construction off of Earth and onto the moon and, and other places in space so that Earth can be more of a um, garden. Um, we're not strip mining the Earth, things like that. We're getting our resources from space. So Jeff Bezos' plan is pretty ambitious, but neither of those, those individuals have, have asked about, you know, have, have really thought about going to Mars. As for working together, um, there's been kind of some tension between Bezos and Musk. Uh, it's kind of a, like a my rocket is bigger than yours than kind of thing between them. Um, they sparred on Twitter a little bit. And so I think they recognize each other as important colleagues. Um, but I'm seeing no evidence right now that they might actually get together and, and sort of combine their ambitions. Well, it should be fascinating to see uh, uh, how this does play out over the next few years and whether it happens in any of our lifetimes. Uh, but we're going to have to leave it there. Uh, Philippe Blondel in Bristol and Eric Berger in Houston. Thanks very much for being with us. And thank you for watching. As always, you can see the program again anytime by visiting our website, aljazeera.com. And for further discussion, go to our Facebook page. That's facebook.com forward slash AJ Inside Story. You can also join the conversation on Twitter. Our handle there is at AJ Inside Story. For me, Hazem Sika and the whole team here, bye for now.